57talk.com, Gary Cubetta, Scottsdale, Arizona. We're back again, Scandor Akbar Part 3. Scandor, big response to your first two shows, and pleasure to have you back with us. Well, it's a pleasure, and thanks for having me, Gary. Scandor, before you became the manager, Devastation Incorporated, yes. Mid-South, World Class, you were you were a great professional wrestler. Uh, yes, yeah, I uh, I was, uh, like I tell everybody, you uh, you, you get, uh, get out of this business of what you put into it, and my heart was always into it since I was a small boy and I knew that I would do it and I would do it in the right way because of you know I've had I had this intestinal fortitude for it and uh, of course uh, uh, you know it, it it really paid off but I can remind you know let me remind the people in those days you had to pay your dues and you could knock around the business for a couple of years and not really make any substantial money but uh, later on uh, uh, this would all come to you if you did it the right way Skander when you created the Persona, Skandor Akbar. Was it? Did you did you copy it off the original sheet? I'll just ask you, just like that. Well, actually, not. I, uh, you know, of course, I'm I'm, a, I'm of a Middle Eastern dis, uh, descent. You know, uh, my father was a uh, was a, a Middle Eastern immigrant, and uh, of course, uh, you know, I had some uh, wrestlers in the family, as I'd mentioned before, uncles and and a cousin, but they lived uh, a great deal of uh, uh, you know distance from me at that time. So actually, I was up in a remote area in, in West Texas where my father and mother had a little mom and pop's grocery store, so I had to really, really uh, 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 just push myself uh, <laughs> by just staying in touch with people a long ways away. So, uh, with, with Skandor Akbar coming up, uh, there were so many sheiks around at that point in time, I, you know, I wanted something different, and I, I don't know, we'll, you know, I can go into the, uh, the, you know, the way that we did this, and the, uh, and, and uh, who really helped me on it. Do it. Tell me. Well, it was in 1966 uh, when uh, Fritz von Erich and uh, Ed McLemore here in Dallas, Texas, had broken away from Morris Siegel in Houston. So they were running Fort Worth on Monday, Dallas Tuesday, and San Antonio on Wednesday, which Joe Blanchard was down there at that point in time, and Frank Brown uh, helping Chris. I'm sorry, uh, helping Fritz. Okay, so what happened was I was in Kansas City at that time, so... uh, uh, we would come down for two or three days a week, and uh, this is when Fritz and Ed McLemore started their territory, which eventually they got. Mr. Siegel died, and then the rest of it, uh, history. So uh, there was, uh, you know, Fritz, I had uh, known Fritz before when I'd broken in briefly. So what we did, we knew a uh, uh, an announcer at KRLD, and his name was Ed Halleck, and he was also uh, the same nationality, you know, Middle Eastern. So uh, we kicked around this and kicked around that. Instead of putting the sheik up there, we came up with Alexander the Great Skandor Akbar. And that's what the Arabic translation is. And uh, at first, I was a little apprehensive because oh, I said, well, you know, that's a tough pronunciation right there to for people to remember. But actually, it worked in my favor because uh, Skandor Akbar does stick in your mind. So... I was happy with it. So that's how that all came about. Skandor, how did the fans originally react to the character? Well, you know, I could say this, you know, it's uh, uh, anybody with this this type of character that lives in, in the United States, right, you know, and even in those days, uh, you know, we were uh, persona heels, so to speak, and, uh, of course, the fans did react to it, and, uh, uh, you know, there was no doubt in their mind because, uh, uh, you know, I, I was a uh, uh, genuine Middle Eastern, and let me uh, reiterate something that I want everybody to know. There has been other, other people that have done this particular type of gimmick we used to call it our character that were not Middle Eastern and uh, to me that was, I was a little chagrined about that because uh, you know they weren't uh, Middle Eastern and uh, uh, but it, it all played out because they never got over with it so so the gimmick was a natural as, yes it was as yes. long as you were naturally Middle Eastern if someone wasn't Middle Eastern they tried the gimmick yes it just it didn't feel right that's right that's right and every and in the in these uh, all these great wrestling fans could you know they could they could look right into it, and, and uh, then uh, they'll say, "Well, that's 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 not right." <laughs> did it bother you in any way that you? Oh uh, well, at first it did, but then again, in the back of my mind, Gary, I knew that uh, uh, it wasn't going to work. It's not going to pan out. No, did it bother you that the the people were 
basically showing their anger for you because you were what you were, Middle Eastern. Exactly. Yeah, but did I, that bother you personally? No. Okay. No, okay. no, no. I learned to live with it. I learned to live with it, and of course, uh, it's, it's been going on for a long, long time. Now, you wrestled in Florida around 1968? Yes, I did, and that's after I had gone back uh, to uh, Oklahoma with uh, Leroy McGurk and uh, and uh, you know, the, you know, the affiliation with Danny Hodge and Leroy McGurk and Luthez, and I had gone to Florida about this time, probably the 1st of June of 1968, and they had a tremendous crew down there. They had the great Malenko, they had uh, Jose Lothario, my great friend, the late Johnny Valentine. Uh, 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 the list went on and on. It was They, they had some great uh, Don Curtis, they had some great talent down there, and I stayed there about four months, and I really enjoyed it. Eddie Graham, of course, was there, and Cowboy Luttrell, you know, they, they basically uh, owned and ran the territory. Were you there before or after? Eddie got hurt, like, in the late 60s, a window or something. Yes, fell. yeah, I, I had been gone two weeks when that happened, and I could tell you where it was, Fort Homer Hesterly Armory, and they had the old-fashioned uh, windows, if you can visualize this, which would kind of uh, come open, like, uh, at an angle, and he was sitting in the dressing room, and all of a sudden, uh, which was an old building, uh, this glass slid out, and this is what I was told, and, and just almost literally scalped him. Yeah, he was in bad shape. But I had been gone about two weeks at that time, and it's and I can tell you it happened around October or late September of 1968. What was it like working in Florida back then? It seems like it could have might as well be 150 years ago. Well, great, great. Uh, did, did they were the payoffs good? Did they take care of the boys? Uh, Okay, uh, I had been in better places. Uh, about that time, everybody was, uh, a lot of the NWA members were getting together and trying to create a pay scale, which you had never done in wrestling. You know, you'd worked off the percentage of the house and everything, but uh, I can say that they were very nice. They took care of me, and uh, honestly, uh, the payoffs weren't the greatest, but uh, I was doing as well, perhaps, as anybody there. Skander, I've never heard about this pay scale before. Was it, it didn't get organized? Did it? No, but it was in the process of being organized. And what was it? What was it going to look like? Well, it was going to look like uh, at those, in those particular times, uh, like uh, five hundred on top, three hundred uh, uh, mid card, and uh, two hundred underneath. Which uh, you know, in those days, was uh, well, pretty good money at that time. But uh, <clears throat> you know, no matter what you uh, what the crowds were doing, and, and the houses and the percentages, uh, they uh, what what uh, what they wanted to do was just uh, have a pay scale. It never materialized. Then you took part in the Battle for Atlanta, which is yes, a very famous story. promotional war. You were there during during most of it. Tell us how that began. Well, actually, in 19, uh, I had been in Atlanta in 66 and 69 and 70, and, and uh, I was doing very well in Atlanta. Uh, Leo Garibaldi was the booker, and then Tom Renesto. In 1972, we were doing very, very well. Ox Baker and I were the uh, Georgia Tag Team champions, and uh, everybody was doing very, very well. Now, let me back up. I had come from Vancouver and the West Coast, and I started in Georgia, but before I left, Tom Renesto had called me and told me that Ray Gunkel had passed away. So I said, how's this going to affect you know, what we're going to do? He said, come right on in. So when Ray Gunkel died in Savannah, uh, of course, Eddie Graham and, uh, and uh, Buddy Fuller and uh, uh, several of them were partners in that Atlanta uh, deal right there. So it was chaotic at first, but uh, they kept it kind of down. So I went in there, and this was August, September, October. Things were going real, real well, and uh, uh, I believe it was just before Christmas time, if I remember correctly, uh, that we were doing very, very well, and we were called... Gunkel. At, you were with Gunkel. Yeah, yeah. The okay, but, the yeah, but Tom Renesto okay. had said, uh, we need to see you guys on Sunday. In those days, we did not work on Sunday. So we met in a, uh, uh, a hotel on the northeast side of Atlanta, and there were several people in there. Fred Ward was running Macon and Columbus, and and those were my towns. I was over real good there with him, and uh, then they then they presented the package of breaking away from the rest of them. So, actually, that's what had happened. So, Ann Gunkel, Ray's widow, put the money up. So, they, she had a pay scale, which was, it was, was uh, uh, you know, was an enticing thing, too. So, 
we all went over to Gunkle. So I stayed there about three or four weeks. Then I had personal problems. I was married here at the time. Uh, my wife had became ill. I had to come back to Texas for a short time, and uh, uh, then I had a chance to go to another territory. So I didn't return, but uh, I did go with Ann Gunkel. Uh, a lot of us did. Uh, uh, the mainstays like uh, Bob Armstrong and Bill Dromo at that time, they went with the other people, but uh, they had pledged it with Gunkel. But Tom Renesto and my friend Jody Hamilton and, uh, uh, you know, the assassins, they all stayed with Gunkel. And uh, they did quite well for a while. As a matter of fact, they ran for a year, two years. Did anyone hold it against you that you had originally sided with Gunkel? Uh, I'll tell you what, a lot of the promoters had called. Uh, we got a lot of calls from some of the promoters because, uh, see, Gunkel was an NWA. So uh, we did get some, and, and they said, well, you know, uh, you can always work for us, but we had rather you not work for them. Well, you know, it, it's it's the old cliche about uh, you, you, uh, you you respect who has been good to you, and and those and, you know wrestling means money. Money meant everything in wrestling. There was a great de- uh, degree of loyalty, but then again, uh, yes, they, I was told that. Yes, you know, we had a lot of calls. What what made Ann Gunkel, a woman in nineteen seventy two seventy three, able to pull this off? Well, okay, I think she did it with uh, the late uh, Tom Renesto, who was uh, I learned so much from Tom about the working aspects of the ring. He and Joe, uh, I think during the time that Gunkel was in, uh, some of his partners had resented Ray Gunkel because he had, I think, he had controlling interests. So uh, uh, there was a lot of animosity for years preceding this, and this is what I was told that Ann Gunkel, uh, she did not like Buddy Fuller, she didn't like Eddie Graham, which Eddie was in on that too. Yet. So this was a, it was an ample opportunity for her to uh, uh, break away, and I think with Tom's guidance, Tom of course was the booker. So I think it was past animosity, and uh, then of course uh, you know everybody coaxed her, oh we can do it, you can do it, and they did it for a while. I've and heard they, that, they I... created a lot of good people out of there. What was Ann Gunkel especially charismatic? Uh, Ann Gunkel, uh, I met Ann Gunkel on occasions and everything. She was very good. She was a charming lady, a beautiful lady. Uh, but I think I think she was a little disillusioned after she got in the promotion so everybody had to guide that along and tell her because a lot of people don't know about the inner workings of wrestling promotions you know uh you know there people some people have to pay the bills and some people want everybody on time and you know a lot of times uh, uh you know the, the great the beauty about wrestling you could you could invest in an old pair of trunks and some boots in those days and a robe and everything like that and start making money but if you had a promotion you had to worry about uh you know keeping the ship from uh, from sinking so a lot of people don't understand Understand that, and I, I think after Ann was in it for a while, she was a little disillusioned about it. But I was not there. I only worked for her for about a month, and she was just a splendid lady. And uh, she died young, and uh, that was tragic. So after Georgia, mm-hmm. your wife gets ill. Then where did you travel to next? Well, the next uh, I, I went to. Uh, actually, I went to uh, the West Coast again, and then I came back in the summer of '71. And uh, this was the only time that uh, that I. I worked Fort Worth and Dallas without just working for the expenses. I used to come through changing territories, and I'd work Fort Worth and Dallas to pick up extra expenses. This time, I worked for Fritz, and the deal was just for summer months. And uh, it, it gave me a chance to be home here with my family. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And we had a bang-up summer. Things were pretty good in Dallas at that time. I had a good crew. You know, Wahoo was here. And, uh, uh, of course, Fritz and uh, some of my good friends from Florida. And then, speaking of Florida, I went back to Florida in 71. And uh, they were they were still doing pretty good. Eddie Graham, making a lot of money back then. What was it, what was it like in the dressing room when you'd, when you'd speak with him? Well, Eddie Eddie Graham, oh, he was, he was, uh, you know, he was cordial. He was uh, uh, good with the boys and everything. And uh, uh, he, he, as far as far as my relationship with Eddie, uh, when I first broke into this business, you know, he had, uh, uh, he was just kind of knocking around uh, and uh, opening matches here in Georgia. And uh, he called himself Rip Rogers. Real name was Eddie Goss. And uh, Eddie got a chance. Jerry Graham got into New York, got over real big. And at that time, uh, Bruno. Uh, they were grooming Bruno for the title, I believe it was, and they were doing tag teams up there. So Jerry Graham needed a partner, so he brought Eddie Graham up in the biggest break of his life. So he became Eddie Graham. 
um, with Jerry Graham and uh, Don Curtis and Mark Lewin were hot tag team, and they had a big run. Uh, I'm sorry, a big run up there. So that's uh, that's basically the way that that all transpired. And then when Eddie, uh, you know, he saved his money, and then went into Florida, and they got in with Cowboy Luttrell. But as far as relationship, you know, Eddie was all business. He was all business. Uh, but Florida was good. Even when I went there in the fall, you know, the access of the beaches, it was great. Did you uh, ever meet up with uh, Jerry Graham, Eddie's uh, so-called but, brother? Uh, very briefly. Yeah, he's one of the guys that I really didn't know that well. But I did meet Jerry. You know, Jerry was a wild guy. <laughs> he was a wild guy. You know, Johnny Valentine used to tell me some stories about he and, he and Jerry Graham in, uh, in New York. But <laughs> I don't know. Hey, what were your impressions of Jerry? Because I, I remember growing up, everyone's like Eddie uh, Jerry Graham. Watch yeah, out! Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know he, you know we had characters in the business in those days. You know he was wild and everything like that. But you know what? He always made his shots. Uh, he could have been out uh, like on a wild rampage the night before and everything. And when he was in New York, New York has so much stuff that was accessible. I mean, you could go crazy over there and, and uh, uh, party all night, and then uh, you know you just worry about the consequences the next day. But he always came through. Scandal, you started in 63, you're wrestling through the 60s into the 70s, were you starting to accumulate the injuries? Myself? Yeah. Well, yeah, I uh, I injured my right knee early in my career, it was called a bucket handle terror. I was up in Kansas City at that time when that happened, but uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's something that I just, uh, I, I didn't want to take time off to rehab in those days. It's not like now, you know, they didn't have the laser stuff, and, and it took, there was a, lot, a great deal of rehabilitation to it and time off, so so what I did, I just kept uh, strengthening in it. And uh, Terry Funk had the same injury I did. Like uh, it's like a little piece of uh, metal that slips in between your leg, a little piece of grizzle that you can't straighten it. But uh, you know, right now I've never done anything to it uh, surgically, so I just learned to live with it. Uh, and then uh, as far as other injuries, I was pretty fortunate up until you know several years had passed by. Did you take a lot of bumps, or did the? Oh yes, yeah, you took bumps in those days, but you took bumps when it was. Uh, necessary uh, uh we didn't have the acrobatic style or anything like that you had guys like uh, vittorio apollo and some of those guys that did a lot of high flying stuff like that but uh you know you're the heel and everything you knew when to take the bumps and uh, when the people would pop with it so we didn't take a lot of bumps but we took enough and i'd like to add this too you know i've worked with flu i've worked with injuries and we just kept going and uh, i think that breed is gone and not saying anything about the modern guy. There's some kids up there I, that I admire and, you know, and around the country and everything I got. I helped start some of them. But, uh, you know, I, I don't blame them now. You know, if they get they get a little hangnail or a sore toe or something like that, then they don't want to work. But we did. Skander, you say that, and, and I'm sure it's probably true. But at the same time, the guys today will take bumps that you, your era never dreamed of. How do you tie those two together? Why are they willing to take the crazy bump, but they're not willing to work if they have the hangnail? I don't know. I really really don't know. I do know uh, sometimes what, 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 what's bred into them now is they uh, the more active they are in the ring, uh, uh, they don't want the people to say it's a dull match or anything like that. But actually, that's that's not really the way it works because, you know, the uh, crowd psychology is what we did in those days. But we did it right, you know, and, you know, you could take one bump when it means something in, a, in opposition to ten that doesn't mean anything. You know, how many, uh, if you go Go out there and you see a guy give a guy 15 clotheslines, and when I started the business, re, uh, 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 logic and reasoning, they all told me, you know, logically, you get a guy 14 uh, 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 clotheslines during the match, you know, how could any human go on? You know, I mean, it's like, and all these power bombs and stuff like that, you know, uh, uh, my goodness, the pile driver in my days was an illegal move. We did angles off of it and everything like that, but, uh, you know, it's, it's changed the fact that they think that I guess what what it is what it's all about is uh, you know the acrobatic style and what have you but you know I don't live in their houses anymore up there but uh, I say up there but around the country and a lot of these independents I try to kind of 
uh, tone it down. And you know what? Uh, there's never anybody that says boring when I'm around these matches. When did the boring chant come into effect? Uh, I, I think it came into effect in New York, uh, around that East Coast for a while. Uh, and, uh, of course, it you know it kind of grew around the country. So uh, I don't yeah. remember it in the 70s. I think it was sometime in the 80s. I believe it was in the 80s because uh, I don't remember it in the 70s. And I think once people started chanting boring, 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 mm-hmm. I remember I remember Harley Race came up uh, when Vince had expanded nationally mm-hmm. and the fans were chanting boring. And I don't think the game was ever the same after that because then the, as a wrestler in the ring, if you heard fans chanting boring, how would you feel about that? What I, what I, how I felt about it and how I taught people and how what my advice was to them, grab a hole and sit down with it. Huh, you know what? That sounds crazy, but you know it works a lot of time because the one thing, Gary, that we never, never did, and this was going way back to some great, great people that I was fortunate enough to help me, uh, they said never let the people dictate to you. Never, never. So we did stuff that was off the wall and people would try. They thought they knew what we were going to do. and We'd double cross them a lot of times and that's how we kept going that that's an interesting concept because the fans start chanting boring normally you would think well you better pick up the pace of the match and you're saying you'd actually slow down the pace of the match yes i did yes yes indeed you sure did and i and it worked and it worked you know eventually you know it didn't work all you know instantly but uh it uh it was uh, something that uh, a lot of guys started doing so we never let anybody any 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 people in my era uh, uh, uh we did all the psychology we did all the dictating and everything like that. Skandor, you, you threw the fire as the original Sheik did. Can can you tell us how that exactly worked? Well... Or no. <laughs> well, uh, the the real way to do it, there, there was a chemical that uh, that you uh, you had to uh, compound and you had to keep it dry. And, uh, you know, once you pinched it, uh, you know, the big orange flame came. And then, of course, you know, they had the magic paper and stuff like A lot of guys did that. Now, when I ran out of the chemical, you know, sometimes you had to, to go to that. But uh, when I threw the fire, I would make sure that it wasn't overdone. A lot of people would say uh, uh, they wanted to be, you know, a lot of people would, uh, they'd wanted to see it every day, every, but not me. And I'd only do it in an angle or something and to make sure the guy didn't come back and wrestle in that particular town for about uh, a couple of three, maybe a mile, three weeks to a month. So when I did it, and I, I did it sparingly, but people would really remember it. Was there a danger to it? There could have been with a with a chemical, but uh, when you know when you, you you mastered this thing about about what to do and how and how far away from your opponent, so uh, that uh, it worked out okay. See, back then, if you used the fire sparingly and you threw it, it it would really set up a tremendous heat and angle that could last for months. Oh yeah, yes, yes, indeed. <clears throat> and they still, you know, they still they they still identify me with this. A lot of people, I still go to some of these places and everything like that, you know, and and uh, they. They talk about the fire. Skander, how I remember you. I lived in the East Coast in the in the seventies, and I remember you coming into the at the time Worldwide Wrestling Federation. How did you get hooked up with Vince Senior? Uh, well, I was in. Uh, uh, I had come back from Australia in seventy five, and uh, I went to Georgia. Tom was uh, after that uh, the thing with Gunkel, and she had folded. But I went back to Georgia because I was uh, looking. Uh, I was looking other places, so it was kind of a jump off place for me. And uh, somebody had told. Him and so uh, uh, I called him. He called me, and uh, so we got. Uh, and I knew Arnold Scolan, and uh, so that's that's how that came by, you know. And I was going to get a shot with Bruno with it. Exactly what had happened on that deal? Stan Hansen had come in with me, my uh, Stan and uh, Frank Goodish, you know Brody. Uh, uh, but Stan got it. He got his first shot with Bruno, and there was a, a deal where he lost his. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he did that uh, scoop slam, and Bruno hurt his shoulder. Legit. Legitimately, he really he really hurt his shoulder. So you know, Mr. McMahon told me he said we got to follow up with this angle. And he said, but uh, you know, so uh, he put me in main events with uh, Putsky, Ivan Putsky, Joe Bednarski, who was over in, in these Connecticut towns, and I never regretted it. I made great money as much as I would if I'd had a shot with him. At, at the time, you were part of Blassie's Army, which had yeah. Stan Hansen, Louis mm-hmm. Sear, Crusher uh-huh. Blackwell, uh-huh. and and yourself. It was a little bit. It was it was like a modernization of professional wrestling. The first. Uh, 
organization within an organization. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it was uh, it was a powerful situation there, and uh, uh, you know he had there was other managers there, and that's that's the way they did business. And Mr. McVan was such a, a very nice person. Uh, he was uh, uh, he would tell you exactly what he was going to do, and uh, and he would sit there. In those days, we did uh, Philadelphia, where the old American Bandstand was, and then uh, the next day we'd go to Hamburg and Allentown and do television. I think that was once every three weeks, and the interviews were unbelievable. It took all day <laughs> uh, to do the interviews and insert them in the bicycle of the programs. Now, um, now, I saw these interviews for years. What, what was it like? They would have the camera facing the ring. Vince McMahon uh, Jr. would be there. What, yeah. Were all the guys just sitting in the back talking? What? No, well, they, you know, you could watch it. They, they had dressing rooms, but you know, they had bleachers. There was nobody during the day. You had to be there at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And those interviews went until we started taping. And uh, uh, that was like uh, it, it, the day before in Philadelphia and then Allentown. Uh, I believe it was in a little town called Hamburg right out of Allentown. Hamburg, right? yeah. And, uh, but uh, as far as uh, uh, the people know Vince McMahon now, he was he was a uh, he was in the uh, television. Uh, he, he was the uh, uh, the guy that uh, did the interviews and everything like that. And, you know, and his father was pretty tough on him, too, you know. You know, uh, he had a uh, he had a thing that he wanted to get, kind of get himself over. And we had announcers like that. They didn't last long. You know, you take a, people like Gordon Soley and, and Jim Ross and some of those Ed Capital that were so good. You know, if a heel fired up, you didn't fire back. And you said, well, sir, that's your opinion. Now let's hear from this guy. So they never say, you know, so uh, Vince Jr. tried to, you know, uh, 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 fire back at the heel and said, no, you don't and everything. And so, uh, you know, his daddy, I would saw see his dad cut in several times, say, hey, uh, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't do this. You know, you got, you know, he, uh, an announcer like that was almost like an arbitrator between a heel and baby face. And uh, the good ones knew how to handle it. And Vince was good. Now the guy, you know, Vince Jr. was good, you know, when they'd settle him down. So there were actually interviews that got left on the cutting room floor because Vince Sr. would come in and stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, you didn't know that uh, he was observing all that, but you found out about it. Where, where would he sit while these interviews were taking place? Oh, well, he would sit back in the monitor in the dressing room. And you'd see him run right out and stop, stop. Oh, yeah. 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 He did that. Yeah. How over was Stan Hansen at the time? Well, he was just coming in, but you know, you got you get in there and they fly you in several uh, appearances before that. That was the that was the way they did business in those days. Uh, so uh, once you got there, they knew who you were. The first time he wrestled in the Garden against Bruno, it wasn't sold out, so the fans hadn't taken to him. But after he broke Bruno's neck, that's right. There was a heat to him that was just extraordinary, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a quirk of nature that happened. That uh, uh, you know, I'd say just a quirk like that. And uh, uh, was it difficult? Then- for you and the rest of the heels that this you know youngster had done something wrong in the ring broken Bruno's neck and yet he really sucked up all the oxygen in the promotion oh he was he was highly uh, 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 Stan was really crushed about it but you know that's part of it uh, and even today I tell the kids if you want to train for wrestling you know uh, there's always that uh, 90% sometimes of uh, a risk of some kind of injury you know and, and uh, you know the, the wrestling business wasn't a Sunday afternoon tea party and you know they call Sometimes they call it entertainment, you know, but, you know, you get together and see how many people hobble that's been in this business. It looks like a war zone sometimes because, uh, no, not at all. And and as far as uh, uh, the, the guys uh, uh, being a little uh, peeved at Stan, no, no, they weren't because everybody was making money up there. Now you you got to realize oh, go the population of those cities up there. You know, if there's a, if there's a uh, 10,000 people that get uh, teed off about a match, they got 10,000 more that'll come in. Now, you came in May 7th. 17th, 1976, your per- first appearance in the Garden, you wrestled Louis Serdan. That's right. Uh-huh. And then they had the Big Shea Stadium show, Ali and Inoki. And I look here, and you weren't on that lineup. Do you remember why you yep. were excluded? Yeah, well, here, uh, you know, they had so many people on there, and uh, they booked me out and a couple of other guys, but I got a real good payoff for it, like if I'd been there. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. McMahon had explained that to me. So, uh, that's, that's so 
okay. Yeah, I, I remember prepping for that, but uh, we we didn't. Uh, I wasn't on. You didn't really get the feature opportunities in the garden, but I remember no, you no. you had a lot of main events in yeah. the in the other towns. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think that uh, at that particular time they were uh, they were just uh, uh, full of heels that had come in, and then uh, like I say, the thing the incident with Stan and everything it kind of changed the complex a little bit. But I have no regrets. I did very very well and. Uh, uh, Mr. McMahon was such a nice person. Was Bruiser Brody in when you were in? Yeah, he came in behind Stan and I. Now, Bruiser at the time, Frank Goodish, was another. He was green. He was just new to the business. Mm-hmm. But he, he got over quickly. Uh, yeah. How, how was he behind the scenes in the locker room at the time? It was okay. I knew Frank from before, you know. And even before he got started, yeah, he, he was okay. In those days, he didn't say a lot. He didn't say a great deal. And uh, as the years progressed, uh, that changed. So, but. But he, you know, he was in, in, in the dray. He was, he was just, uh, uh, he was happy to be there, eating his can of tuna. The executioners were there at the time. Do you remember them, Chuck oh, O'Connor yeah. and? Oh uh, yeah, well they created that team. Yeah, over there, and uh, 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 that was Walter Kowalski and uh, Chuck O'Connor, and, and uh, uh, they wanted to create this heel team, and which they did. And uh, uh, you know, Joe Scarp and, and uh, the other guy, uh, White Wolf, Billy White Wolf. Yeah, uh, uh, they were. Uh, uh, it was it was designed for them to have a run with those guys. At the, that was Killer Kowalski's last major run with a with a major promotion. He wrestled independent after that. Could you tell in the dressing room that he was getting near the end? He looked good in the mask. Yeah, he looked good and everything, but you know, he, he became frustrated easily and then uh, sometimes he'd, you know, complain about uh, not exactly being tired, but he said, you know, uh, sometimes he'd become disenchanted with some stuff, but, uh, you know, he was always a gentleman, did his job and everything, so uh, a lot of the guys complained because, uh, you know, they work so tight. But you see, that came from the old days. Yeah. Did you wrestle Bruno in the smaller arenas? No. After he got no. hurt, or you never had a match with Bruno? No, no, no. He was limited after that. I, I think uh, after I had gone that he was, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he had some of the smaller arenas, but, you know, they, they didn't want him to get hurt again. When he was in the dressing room prepping for a big match and you're there, after mm. he got hurt, were they real careful with the guy he was facing? Be careful, don't hurt Bruno? Well, so to speak. Speak, yeah, you know Bruno was was a you know he was a powerful guy and a good athlete, and he learned this business good. And he was a gentleman. I had a lot of he and I uh, became pretty good friends. He was he befriended a lot of people. But yeah, there was always that uh, outside chance that he might get hurt again until he really healed up. But he was such a powerful man, and then uh, he had good recuperative powers and everything. So uh, you know, it, uh, time just went on by, and Bruno had a tremendous run in there. Did you did you regret leaving or? No, 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 no. I had other places to go. You know, I was concentrating on overseas and stuff like that. I thought you were over pretty good. I, I mean, I thought you did. Yeah, good- well, I did. Yeah, everything was fine. Uh, uh, but I don't know. I just uh, I really and truly just wanted to uh, explore other options and everything like that. So uh, I had uh, a chance to make just as much money in different places and everything like that that I haven't been. So, Skander, you mentioned that 1975 you were in Australia. Tell me a little bit. We'll go back in time a bit. Tell me a little bit about what that was like was was Jim Barnett in charge at the time? No, he was gone. Okay, Jim Barnett was uh, ousted from the country because of income tax. Okay. Finally, uh, so they had another promotion. My cousin Frankie Kane, uh, which was a great Mephisto, came in there and took the book for Larry O'Day and uh, uh, his partner. And uh, they everybody said, "Well, it's not going to be the same because Barnett." So they were limited for a while on their budget and everything like that. But because uh, my cousin came in there and turned everything around, so uh, he called me in 1975 and uh, I went there and I stayed seven and a half months and uh, he took over a situation that was fledging and they started operating the black everything was they started making money but you know he spent day and night uh, getting this thing ready and and uh, we had some good talent and everything and uh, I had I became Australian champion there for a while and give, uh, give me some of the names that were working there at the time yeah yeah Moose Morowski myself and uh, uh, we we would bring in uh, a lot of other guys. Uh, there were so many guys around. Mario Milano had uh, he did real well, and he he still is in Australia to this day. And he was over real good. Fans probably won't remember because Mario worked along. I think he worked in New York 
Park at one time too before he went over there. But uh, there was guys from New Zealand, and uh, and uh, really and truly, there were so many guys that that were over there that people never heard of and everything like that. We didn't have to do that. We just, uh, you know, we had a handful of us guys and everything. And they they said they'd never do it, but Barnett, we did just as much business as they did. I've never been in Australia, so it's a little bit difficult for me to picture. Did they have like major towns or? Yes, they did. did we lived in Sydney, did... Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, uh, Brisbane. They were the large cities, and we did them all. Did you work seven days a week, six days? No. Five days? No, no five, six days a week. Was it a tough schedule? Mm, well, we flew just about every, everywhere. They had uh, TAA, Trans-Australian Airlines. We flew most of the times there. And then uh, we uh, once in a while, we drove to Canberra, the capital. From uh, But in those days, you know, you had super highways out of Sydney, about 50 miles. You came to Chuggo. So we really, uh, what we really did, we flew a lot, and it was a pretty tough schedule. But you know what? It was it was good, and uh, the, the fans over there were just great. How did it work with uh, your cousin, the great Mephisto, and yourself basically doing the same gimmick? Well, we had the same gimmick at that time, and uh, it was uh, it worked out okay because you know he he would kind of drop off a little bit in the uh, back in the wayside and everything like that, and then uh, uh, we had I had great heel matches sometime with Moose Morowski, you know, and made him big baby faces and everything and but uh, uh it, it was it was really good and <clears throat> i was a little apprehensive too you know i told him i said because i don't know you know after uh, barnett had all of the names like that and my goodness we did as good as well as they ever did. Skander, you mentioned that you flew a lot when you were in australia you must have flown just hundreds of thousands of miles during your career yes i did Where, did you like flying yes Oh, yeah. You yeah, didn't I, I didn't really mind it until, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, uh, fast forward the clock to the 80s and 90s when all this was going on and uh, with the world class and then the UWF and then Mid-South and, and uh, uh, really and truly then I started kind of burning out on it. And I still have a lot of memories. I've, I've flown uh, to the, some of these signees here in recent years and everything like that. But, did, you, uh, did you have any close calls in the early days or what seemed like close oh, calls? Oh, kind of. You know, we were on Southwest Airlines. Uh, going from New Orleans to Houston and uh, one man gang and I were sitting there and there was such a turbulent flight this one lady threw up and thought we were going to crash and everything but that I don't know they just kept on going sounds like me <laughs> you know it reminds me of a story in Florida 1968 Lester Welch had a plane and uh, so some of the big guys like myself like Johnny Valentine Tank Morgan myself you know we went on that small plane one time and then uh, Atlantic Graham would fly through those clouds and I'm sorry uh, 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 Lester Welch would so they said uh, in those days we ran San Juan that's before Carlos and we ran Nassau and Freeport out of the Florida office that's 1968 and uh, so we started the bigger guys started flying commercial and I remember Joe Scarpa who later became Strongbow up there you know he was so ter- terrified of uh, flying you know that uh, he wouldn't even drink he couldn't drink water without throwing up <laughs> so anyways maybe, maybe I, that's I, you know what, what what I'm trying to say is I've, I've flown through a lot of turbulent weather. Yeah. What was Joe Scarpa like when he became Chase Strombo over like like a million Yeah, bucks? well, when I saw him in New York, it changed somewhat, but when I saw him in Florida, he was just a happy, happy-go-lucky guy, but I guess there was pressure on him in New York, and he was a different guy. In what way? Well, I mean, you know, he was... Uh, uh, you know, we didn't talk about the stories. You know, in the dressing rooms in those days, they were a lot of fun. We were business, but we, you know, uh, everybody was loose. You know, in opposition to what happens today. So, what dressing? Uh, what dressing room was just the best? Where you'd go and it's like old family. Was there one in particular? Oh, uh, they were all they were all pretty good. I, 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 you know, of course, I my uh, first, uh, you know, the NWA uh, Tulsa and, and uh, uh, really and truly, I, I loved uh, that little territory Joe Dusick had up there. And and he was a great payoff man. Kansas City was loose. Uh, uh, you had a lot of fun in those territories. Atlanta was good. And uh, those were, you know, some, just to mention a few. L- looking at your entire career, was there ever a dressing room that, where you just, the energy was, ter- was, the, was terrible? You just, oh, man, this is, this is not good? No. NWA Crockett? Uh, N.W.A. Crockett, you know, I, I met Mr. Crockett and everything, and I had a lot of chances to go in there. I never really worked for him, but ac- after uh, uh, they bought out, uh, uh, you know, U.W.F. with Bill when they purchased that, you know, it was kind of funny there at that time. I don't, I don't know. I, I say funny it was a little. Uh, everybody was on edge, and I hadn't experienced that. It was my first experience. Everybody was on on edge because uh, they wanted to make this thing go and put the East Coast out of business and everything like that. So. That 
that was one I didn't really particularly enjoy. I think some people have told me that Crockett at the time was trying too hard, that the cards were too stacked. Could have been, could have been, yeah. but they spent a lot of extra money, which they shouldn't have. But Did you know at the time that, did you think to yourself, man, that they're just throwing money away, or, or in um, retrospect? More or less. Uh, you know, a lot of people felt that way. But it was not a comfortable dressing room, i tell you that right now. Of course, they had, you know, they had little cliques in there. I mean, well, I don't say cliques, but, you know, Dusty, he's he a good friend. They were all, they were all, they were all good. But everybody from the top on down were, they were kind of, a, it was like an apprehensive deal there. It was like, uh, you know, nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. You must have been missing the classic days of World Cup. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thinking, oh, man, I wish it was 1982 again. Yes, that's true. Sir. Yeah, I sure was, Gary. Oh, Okay, Skander. Skandor, it's been a pleasure. Our third show. These shows have been very well received. I want you to know the <laughs> wrestling fans have not forgotten Skandor Akbar. Well, I appreciate that, Gary. And and, uh, and I, let me say this to all the fans. Thank you. And also, uh, uh, you keep listening to Gary because he's the greatest. And everything I can do to help you, Gary, I, I certainly will. And uh, I'm in contact with some people. And who knows? We'll go from here. See what happens, Skandor. We'd love to talk to some of you. you we know you have many friends in the business. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yes, Gary, and same to you and all the great fans. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.